go ahead and have a seat. I, I hope that's the prayer of, of your heart today, that God would just crush you, <laughs> impress you. I, I don't think we often pray that prayer and say, God, crush me, impress me. Um, I need to be done with myself and, and let you come out. Your power, uh, your grace come through me. But that should be our prayer that we would humble ourselves, that we would seek to crucify the flesh the Bible t- talks about so that his spirit can live within us, so he can demonstrate his power in us. And so it's a great prayer, that song. Uh, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. As you're turning there, I just want to also add one more announcement that uh, I want to make sure to say, and that is that next uh, Sunday we will begin our, our Grow Class B. So uh, in front of you there's our track, a little bookmark there. It's our discipleship track we've talked about. And uh, we got Connect, Grow, and Reach. And we're now at the Grow Class B in that. And so at 9 o'clock for the next three Sundays, we will have Grow Class B happening uh, in our library over here by the offices. And so it, if you haven't made it to any of the other classes before, that is okay. Each one can stand on its own. And so we're going to be, like this next Sunday, I'm going to be doing an overview of the Bible. So you're going to, in one hour, you're going to get a picture of the Bible from start to finish. Uh, a great summary of what God has done from Genesis to Revelation and what he is wanting to do. And so uh, it's going to be a really good class. I encourage you to come for these next three weeks doesn't matter where you're at uh, in your faith, you're, you're all welcome to come. So uh, come on out, 9 o'clock in the library uh, next Sunday. Okay, we, if, you're, uh, if you're new to Bethany uh, you, and you came uh, in the last couple of weeks, then you're, you're coming today in the middle of a, a, a series that we're doing called uh, Bringing the Church into Focus, 1 Corinthians. And Paul, a letter here in, in Corinth, in called 1 Corinthians, um, it was a letter that Paul, the apostle, uh, a follower of Jesus, after Jesus' death, wrote to a church that he had founded. He had started that church in Corinth uh, about four years earlier, and then after he had planted the church, he went on his missionary journey uh, to plant more churches. And so he had heard things that were going on in the church there, and, uh, and he had received letters from people in the church asking questions. And so he is writing them a letter to tell them, uh, some, address some of the concerns that he has about their church, bring them into focus, and then, and then help them understand some of the answers, to, or give them some of the answers to the questions that they had. And some of the questions they had had to do with marriage and, uh, and, and slavery, and like, what, did, what do we do in this new state we're in as Christians? If we were married, uh, should we stay married, or do we leave our spouses to follow the Lord? If, we were, if we're single, do we, do we get married? If we were a slave, uh, do we fight to have freedom? Um, if we're, if we're, you know, and so just, he, he's going through and he's addressing some of this right now, and we kind of interrupted it with Palm Sunday and Easter, so we took a little a pause there in the middle of chapter 7, uh, and so we're going to pick that up. And as we, <clears throat> we had talked about marriage and intimacy within marriage and God's design for that right before Palm Sunday, and I, I said, hey, if you're single, we're going to be you know, getting to you after Easter, we're going to be talking about that. Paul's going to address some stuff about, about being single and if you're here today you might, and you're not single, you're, you might be going, oh, I, I can tune out. No, like, that's why I addressed it, called it here, being single-minded, okay? Uh, we all need to be single-minded, and he's going to give us some, to, some things here about being single-minded that is important for us. But I also told those who are single, I said, I'm going to give you some, some, some tips and help uh, for, for singleness. Uh, I, I was single until I was 26. That's when I married Christy, and I won't tell you how old she was, but uh, we, uh, we got married in our late 20s, and, uh, and so I know, and, and I worked with singles uh, many uh, years before I came here. I was My ministry was to, to singles, and so um, I know it can be a trying and a difficult time, and I said I was going to give you some tips, and so here's, I'm going to start out with just some things that, uh, some tips here for you. These are 
if you're single and you're trying to find the right person and you want to find a, a, a Christian person, you need some good pickup lines, right? So here's just some, some good pickup lines for you here that uh, you can... So, <clears throat> is this seat saved? Because I am. All right, see, there you go. All right, you can have, all right, identify. Are they, are they saved? Are they Christian? All right, uh, how about... Can I get your name and number so I can add you to my prayer list? All right, there you go. Uh, are you related to Abraham's nephew? Because I like you a lot. It's, Abraham's nephew was named Lot, if you're new to the Bible there. See, that's why if you didn't get that joke, you need to come next week uh, to grow a class B. All right. Uh, now I know why Solomon had 700 wives. Because he never met you. That's, that's, that's a good one right there. That's a good one, right? Okay. Uh, I've been working on being more spirit-led, and the spirit led me straight to you. <laughs> Is your name Grace? Because you're amazing. This is good, right? These are these work. I told you, I'm going to help you out. All right, so, hey, girl, the Bible said to think about what is pure and lovely, so I've been thinking about you all day. <laughs> and last but not least, this is uh, Charlie and time. You guys will appreciate this one. Um, is your name Faith? Because you're the substance of things that I hope for. <laughs> all right. That's a Hebrews joke. You read Hebrews. It talks about the definition of, of faith being the substance of things hoped for. All right, so, yeah, all right. Okay, so I actually I'll have some better ideas here for you uh, as we go through, through this. Um, okay. Did any of those work for me? I No, I said, uh, Christy, you want to pray? I got something for you to pray about. Uh, let's, let's have some dinner so I can uh, I need you to pray about something. And... Uh, about leadership, about being involved in my leadership group, and so that we started talking. Uh, but our story is a little different because I was the head of the young adults group that she was a part of, and so as the pastor of the young adults group, I had to be very careful about, um, you know, I was like, do I, can I date people within my group here? What's going on? And so uh, I had to like go to the elders of our church uh, and to say, hey. How, is, how would this look? Would this be okay? And they said, we don't want you to have to go to another church. Uh, and they said, who are you thinking about uh, dating? And I told them, they said, she's a good one. So I got permission by the elders of the church to, to go out. They, they said, just don't play any games, and I, and, which is a good rule. It, no one should play games. But they said, just don't play any games because, you know, what you do could imp- definitely impact the group. And I'm like, absolutely. I want to make sure that Christ is first here in the group. And so I actually took her out that night. Uh, and uh, we had dinner, and I said, hey, I just want to lay it all on the table here. So I told her exactly my intentions, and uh, I said, are you, are you up for that? And, and my intentions being, I want to date for the purpose of marriage, and uh, I think you, would, you seem to be like a good person that I might uh, marry, and so I would like to, to, to date with that, that purpose. She said, I'm on board, and uh, it, everything was downhill from there. Yeah, that, the rest is history. Um, so it, is, it worked. There was no pickup lines. All right, <laughs> okay. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to go into 17. We're going to try to cover a lot of verses here, so um, let's go. All right, it says, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised has anyone been called in uncircumcision he is not to be circumcised circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but what what matters is the keeping of the commandments of god each man must remain in that condition in which he was called okay so right now you're like oh, what does this have to do okay so right in the middle of this passage about marriage and uh and singleness and stuff he, he starts talking about circumcision and uncircumcision. Because, there, like I said, there's people that are like, we're, we're now a Christian. 
Some were circumcised because they were, came out of uh, the Jewish tradition to follow Christ, and some were uncircumcised. They had come out of the Gentiles, and now they've formed the church through faith in Jesus. And so, like, do, if I was circumcised, do I become uncircumcised? Apparently, there was some type of surgery type things that they were doing back then to actually try to reverse circumcision or to make it appear that you were uncircumcised. We won't get into the details on that. Okay, but, um, and, then, and then they're like, but do I, do I live differently there? And Paul's like, circumcision, uncircumcision doesn't matter. What matters is that you're being obedient to the Lord. Like, where is your heart at? And that's really kind of going to be the, the case for all of these things, these categories he talks about here. Am I being obedient to the Lord? Am I following the Lord uh, in my walk? Verse 21, he says, were you called while a slave? Called being, I was, came, became a Christian while I was a slave. Do you, do, he says, don't worry about it. But if you're able to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. He says, so you're, we're all slaves. We're slaves to Christ. He goes, and so if you're a slave, though, on this earth, uh, and slavery back then, like, mo- a majority of the people were slaves. They were indentured servitude, kind of a thing that they would have. And so this is speaking to a lot of people here in the Roman Empire. And so um, he says, look, like, don't say, well, now that I'm free in Christ, he goes, I need to, like, become, get out of slave- slavery there. He goes, no, but if you can get out of slavery, Wonderful. Go for that. I'd rather be free but, than to be a slave. He says, but just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you need to rebel and, and push out of, out of that uh, in the name of Christ. He says, free is better, but in the name of Jesus, you might need to stay. Like, I'm not asking for you, there to be a rebellion here. Like, he's not calling for a rebellion of, in, in this process. He says, but you are a slave to Christ. So whatever state you're in, free or slave, you are a slave to Christ. You see, follow Christ. Be obedient to, to, to him. And then, <clears throat> goes on, then verse 24, he kind of summarizes, Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. And then he goes on now concerning virgins. And so he's going to start talking about singleness. He says, so he says, don't, just because you came to Christ doesn't mean you need to change your status, didn't need to change that one way or the other. You need to be fulfilling your call to Christ, being single-minded. And so if I were to sum this first part up, we should be focused on our calling wherever we are. Wherever we are, focus on our calling in the Lord. If you're single, be single for the Lord. If you're married, be married for the Lord. If, if you're, if you were, we're not dealing with slavery today, but it, he's saying if you're a slave, do it for the Lord. Glorify God in that. If you're free, glorify God in that. If you're circumcised, glorify God as a circumcised person. If you're uncircumcised, glorify God as an uncircumcised person. Because you don't need to change the status there to follow the Lord. Focus on your calling. What has he called us to do? He's called us to make disciples. He's called us to to be the light, to glorify him in all that we do. And so do that. Serve Christ. Be obedient to him. That's what we're called to do. Now, uh, he's going to say here, or he did did say here, like if you're, if you like you're a slave, though, it's okay to desire freedom. And I, this is what I want to camp on a little bit here. If, if you are single, it's okay to desire marriage. He's not saying it's not okay. He's not saying it's wrong to desire a different state than you're in. He's not, he's not saying that. He says just whatever state you're in, do it for the Lord. And sometimes we think that if you're single, you're supposed to just like suck it up and just be content. And that means be content means not to desire to be married. He's not saying that. He's not going to go on here to say that. None of that says that. He's not saying, hey, if you're a slave, just don't 
be, just be content as a slave and don't desire freedom. He actually says it's rather to be free. So it's okay. So, and it, but he's not going to say that about marriage. He says, actually he's going to go on and say if you're like single, he says, that's a blessed state to be in. He goes, I would rather you, if you can, stay single because you can follow the Lord. We're going to look at this more. But it's not wrong to desire marriage. He said that earlier in the chapter. He said, hey, if, if, if you want to be married, it's not wrong to be married. But contentment doesn't equal lacking desire for something else. It, it's not the absence of good desires. God has put desires in us that are good. And so there are many desires that we have that are right and are okay. And so... I, I would, to the next point, I would say is cultivate your God-given passions. Cultivate those. Like, whatever passions God's given you that are, if they're from God, like, the problem is sometimes our, a lot of our passions are twisted, right, and become evil and wicked, and so there's evil desires. But we have a lot of passions that are good, and that are given by God, and so if God hasn't placed on you the desire to remain single, then it's okay to desire that, and so you can cultivate that passion. But if you're single and you haven't found the right person, cultivate the passions, other passions God's given you. Like if, if God's given you a passion, uh, you know, for certain hobbies or sports and things, you know, do those things. Do them for the Lord. Cultivate that. Don't, you don't have to, don't sit around and wait for your status to change in order to say, now I can pursue these things. Now I can do this because I've gotten married, right? No, like just cultivate the things as a single person. Cultivate the passions, the God-given passions that he's given you. Um, you don't have to like being single. But you also don't want to struggle. Uh, you don't want the struggle of singleness to like be so be debilitating. Where you're like, I can't move on. I can't live until I get married. It's like, live. Live. Honor God. Worship God. Live as a single person. Uh, Cultivate those passions. Invest in the relationships that you have now. Like, don't sit there and say, well, you know, one day I'll, I'll, you know, get married and then I can really serve God. It's like, no, like, if you're single, invest in the relationships that you have now, because it's through those things that you're going to grow. I mean, God gives us a spouse. One of the main things that a spouse does for us, besides fulfilling some of the desires that we have for physical intimacy that is there, but the other reason why God designed marriage is to shape us. It's like to be in a relationship with another person that we, it becomes like a mirror to us where we start to see all of our selfish ways, our problems, stuff like that, and we got to work those things out in a marriage in order to have a happy marriage. We have to become a better person. We have to learn to compromise. We have to learn to, which means set aside a lot of our selfish desires. And so marriage is a, re, a refining tool that God has given us to become more holy. Read the book, Purpose, uh, not, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Sacred Marriage, thank you. Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas. I think one of the best books, if not the best book on marriage. Uh, so, great book. He talks about that. What if God made design marriage to make, not to make us happy, but to make us holy? But really, marriage is unique in how it can do this, but all relationships can help us become better people. And that's ultimately the goal, is that we grow in Christ. And so invest in the relationships that you have now. Cultivate the, the passions, the desires that God has given you in your life. Live life wherever you're at. Focus on your spiritual health and growth. Like, don't say, well, when, once, I, once I get married, then I, can, you know, then I can actually serve God in the church. Then I can actually be the person God wants me to be. no. Live singly, like focus on your spiritual health and growth now. Your spouse doesn't complete you. That is not, that's a lie uh, from the pit of hell that this person completes you. God completes you. 
Only God does that. Your contentment in life, again, it's not a lack of desire. Your contentment means that I trust God wherever I am at. And I will, and I am self, the word content means to be self-sufficient. And in the Lord, I am self-sufficient. I have, in him, I have everything I need. When Paul in Philippians uh, 4, I think it is, or no, Philippians 4, yeah. He says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? He says, I've learned the, the, the secret of contentment. Like in, in, in plenty, if I've got everything I need, and in want, if I've, I'm totally poor and don't have anything. He goes, I've learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so whether I'm single or married, you, we need, we all need the Lord. And, if, and this is one of the problems that we, we make in marriage is we paint a picture oftentimes that marriage somehow makes us happier. It, make, it makes life easier. And so single people are like, I want that. It's like, no, marriage is hard. Hard. Marriage is, is, is hard, hard work. And if you sit in there thinking that, well, once I get married, then, you know, then I'll be complete. That's, that is, that's not true. We need to find our, our, our wholeness, our fullness, our power in the Lord. When we do these things here, when we cultivate the God-given passions that he has given us, when we invest in the relationships that we have now, when we focus on our spiritual health and growth, if we do those things now, we are, what we're doing, if you want to be married, is you're preparing yourself for marriage. You are making yourself much more marketable for marriage as well. But if we sit around and, let, and, and not being content in the Lord, and we sit around as single people being debilitated, say, I can't, you know, I can't get out, I can't do anything, or whatever, we start to look worse and worse like a good option for someone else. It's when you're thriving in your singleness that you become the best person for someone else, and that's what you want to do. You want, on your wedding day, if you want to be married, on your wedding day, you want to be presenting to the other person the best person that they need in their life. And so, are you working right now to be the best spouse for that other person. That's what you should be striving for. And we're going to do that by serving the Lord completely, focusing on our calling wherever we are at. Okay, let's keep reading here. Starting in verse 25 now. He says, now concerning virgins, uh, so here I'm talking about unmarried people, okay, unmarried ladies. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord. But I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that this is good in view of the present distress. That it is good for a man to remain as he is. He says, I'm not, he's like, I'm not saying this is from the Lord. I'm not saying God's giving me this command. But he goes, but from my experience, from my wisdom as an apostle, he goes, I think it's good for a man to remain as he is, for a single person to stay in the, the state of singleness as they are. He says, are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be released. He says, I'm not saying then, so then now go and get divorced, because I think he's saying that singleness is, is a better place to be. He, he's not saying, so go get divorced. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. He says, but if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. If you get married, he goes, the, the, the times are tough. He goes, and, and we would say the times are tough today. Paul was thinking that, like, really, that like we're living in the end times, and, uh, and we are. We're still living in the end times because we're waiting for Christ to come back. And so he's saying, like, it's, it, it's difficult as a Christian, it's going, life is going to be difficult. And marriage isn't going to make it easier. <laughs> That's what he said. Mar- when you get married, it doesn't solve your problems. It doubles your problems. Because now your problems, you, have, you, I mean, you, you ha- still have your problems, but you also have their problems. Because now you're one flesh, and so you've doubled your problems. You've solved one small problem, and now you're married, if, you, if that was a problem for you. 
but you still have problems. And you think like, oh, well, uh, marriage will solve my problems with lust. Uh Uh-uh. You'll carry those problems of lust right into marriage. The only problem it solves is that you're, you're no longer single. That's the only problem. Like, if that was your problem. But if you were a lustful person before marriage, you're going to enter marriage and you're still going to be a lustful person. And you're going to struggle in there. So marriage doesn't solve our problems, he says. And so he says, I'm, I'm telling you, like, in the, in the last days here, he goes, it, I say I'd recommend singleness. He says, it's a good thing. And then, uh, but he says, but if you want to be married... He says, it's okay. It's not a sin. He says, it's not a sin to be married. No, God created marriage. God designed marriage. He created it. It's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. He says, but if you think it's going to solve all your problems, then, then you're, you're mistaken. And he goes, I think, with a, he's like, personally, he's like, I think if you can, stay single, is what Paul is saying. Uh, verse 29, he says, but this I say, Brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none and those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice and those who buy as though they did not possess and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For, for, for the form of this world is passing away. So the next point where I'd sum this up and say is this, live in the truth that this world is fleeting. Like we should, this is something we, this is to be single-minded. All of us should live like this. He's talking not just about single people here, but that we all should be living in the truth that this world is passing. This world is fleeting. This world is not all that there is. Do we have the next slide there? Did I, did I give that one? Oh, there you go. Live in the truth that this world is fleeting. Perfect. Okay, so he says don't complicate your life more than you need to. I already talked about that. Like, marriage it complicates your life more. He says, don't, don't complicate your life more than you need to. Don't place your spouse above your calling. He says, you're called, so don't place your spouse above your calling. Like, you're called to the Lord, first and foremost. You, you love the Lord through loving your spouse. Like, you're called to love your spouse. Why do you do that? Because you love the Lord. You don't say, well, my spouse comes first, my family comes first, the Lord comes second. I will do God stuff when I can, when I find time. No, I love the Lord first. I'm called to to follow him. And so, but I am married, so I'm going to love my spouse as he has called me to. I love God by loving my spouse. Don't be caught up in possessing this world. Oh, so don't be uh, over emotional about earthly affairs. He says. He says, "Hey, look. If, if you're weeping, don't weep as though uh, or those who weep shouldn't weep as though they uh, should weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice should rejoice as though they did not rejoice." What's he talking about there? He's talking about like getting overly emotional about the things of this world. And so this is for all of us. Again, we all should be living in the truth that this world is fleeting. And if this world is fleeting, if this world is passing, then why we get overly emotional about the things of this world? Sometimes we live in our emotions. We let our emotions overtake us way too much. Why? Because we're putting so much emphasis oftentimes on this world. And this is what we talked about at, at Easter, you know. I used the, the illustration with this rope here that uh, last week. That you know, this is our life right here. This blue part is our is our is our life on Earth, and then all of this is all this tangled mess is eternity. Uh, and so we have we have eternity, you know. And and this is what we're living for is is the rest of this. And that's our focus. But this, we get overly emotional about this. He's saying, look. Your life is fleeting. So focus on your calling to the Lord. Don't get overly worked up about the things of this world. And he says, don't get caught up in possessing this world. He says, if you buy, don't don't live like you're possessing these things. Like, 
the things of this world are going to pass away. We can't, the, Jesus talks about this, right, in Matthew 6. He says, hey, don't store for, for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. Don't buy like we're possessing things here. We don't possess anything in this world. This world is all going to pass away. He says, don't get caught up in the pleasures of this world. He says, those who, verse 31, those who use this wor- the world as though they did not make full use of it. That's what he's talking about there, like finding pleasure in this world, like making full use of this world, like, oh, this world is all that I'm living for. No, he's live for eternity. All right, and then let's go to the last section here. This one goes pretty fast. Okay, verse 32. But I want you to be free from concern. That's what he, he's like, I want you to be free from concern. This is one of the things he's pushing for here. And being married, he says, not free from concern. I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Because I, I, wanna, I want you to be undistracted. So I'd sum this part up here. Live an undivided life for the Lord. That's what we want to be doing. We want to be undivided, undistracted, living our lives for the Lord. And he says in marriage, when you get married, now you're going to be concerned about their well-being. And in so doing, sometimes you're not going to be able to just go all in for whatever God might be calling you to do. You can't, if God's calling you to go and like, hey, I, I just feel this burden to go to Africa and, and uh, be, be a missionary in Africa, but you're married, you're like, I got to get, kind of get them on board with this too, right? You're, you're just not as free to, use, to be used by God. He says, but live undivided. He goes, once you're married, you're, you're now compromised a bit in that. And you can't just do that as, as easily. But like I said, live your married life for the Lord. And live, if you are married, live as undivided as you can for the Lord. Love your, like live your life for your spouse for the Lord. Like the goal of your life, the, the goal we have on this earth is to glorify God, right? We've got to glorify God. That's, that's what we're called to do, to glorify God with all of our being, to glorify him in your marriage, glorify him in your school, glorify him at work, glorify him through your passions, glorify him in your singleness, glorify him wherever you're at, live for the Lord. Use the things of this world to help you glorify the Lord. And then he goes on uh, here to talk about something in the next several verses that don't really pertain to us because we don't have uh, arranged marriages. Although for some of you, that might be, might be like, hey, that might work better for me. Uh, and so if so, uh, if you're just come let me know. I will arrange marriages here uh, for you. I'll do that. No, just kidding. Okay, uh, but he goes on, verse 36, he says, But if any man thinks that he is un- acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth, and if, he must, if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will, and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So then both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, he who does not give her in marriage will do well better so he just says yeah for the 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 dad that has in that day that had that right to give his daughter away um, in marriage he says yeah like 
you're not doing wrong either way you go. Like, marriage is great. Singleness is better, he said. And so you're not doing wrong either way. Then verse 39. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But in my opinion, he says, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. And so that last part there, just kind of to give us a little bit of, again, just a little perspective there. Marriage, marriage is for this life. Till death do us part. That's when we make those vows. It's till death do us part. We are called to be married for this life. We're not married in eternity. Jesus made that clear. And it doesn't mean we're not going to know our spouse. It doesn't mean we're not going to love our spouse in eternity. It doesn't mean we're not going to have a great relationship with them and appreciate them. But it's not what marriage on earth is for. Marriage on earth, marriage is a temporal thing. So, in light of eternity, how much weight do we put on singleness and marriage? We, we need to have a healthy perspective on that. And so if you're, if you're a married person, your goal in this life is not to get your unmarried friends married. Like, that's not our goal because Paul says that actually they're in a, he, he thinks they're where, where they're as a good thing. So it's okay. Being single, you don't have to be, you don't have to think that like your desire to be married though is wrong. It's fine. He just, just as a slave should desire to be free, if you have a desire God's put on your heart to be married, that is not a wrong desire. It does not mean you're not content doesn't mean you're being immature because you want to be married. Nope, not at all. That's a good, it's a fine desire. It's a godly desire, God-designed marriage. So don't feel ashamed to say, I want to be married. That's fine. Just don't let that debilitate you and not allow you to live for the Lord right where you are. And all of us, married or single, we want to be single-minded and that we're saying, God, I am here to serve you, for you to be glorified in me. As we come to communion now, we remember Jesus who came to this earth who was single-minded. He said, I have come here to give my life as a ransom for many. He said, that's why I came. I came to follow God, to be obedient to the Father up to the point of death on the cross. Will we follow in his footsteps as he's called us to do, to lay down our cross and follow him, to be single-minded, focused on him, say, God, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Whatever state I'm in, I will serve you. Let me be single-minded for you, Lord. So as we come to this table, we remember our Savior who was single-minded and died for us. Let us Ask him to help us to be single-minded as well. Let's pray, and then you can come and receive the elements. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came to this earth, and he lived a single life. He lived as one who was single. He glorified you, Father, in his singleness, and he gave his life wholly for you that he might lay down his life for us. So, Father, as we come to the table, we remember our Lord and Savior. We thank you for his life that was given for us, that we might have life and that we might live for you too. Father, I pray for those in our congregation who are single and who are desiring to be married, I pray, Lord, that you would fulfill those desires that they have, that you would help them to live for you, to become the people that you want them to be so they would be the best spouse that they can be. Father, for those who are single in our congregation that, that 
do not desire marriage, but are very happy just being single. I thank you for that, Lord, and help them just to be, uh, to, to be empowered to, to, to glorify you in the state that they are in. And for those, Lord, who are married, Lord, help us to be undivided in our marriage. That, we wouldn't, that our marriage wouldn't be a distraction from you, but that as one flesh with our spouse, that we could serve you better, that we could glorify you together. Lord, whatever state we're in, may we live for our calling in you to be your disciples, to glorify your name. It's through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that we are saved and can live as your slaves in this world. May we be slaves of yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come and receive.